Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. It's hot and mowing your lawn is hard work. Today we're going to look at alternatives to grass. Also, most insecticides don't kill all bugs. You have to use the right one. Which one is it? That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Joellen Diamond. Ms. Joellen is the Director of Landscape at the University of Memphis. And Mr. D is here. Howdy. All right. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here. All right, Joellen, let's talk about lawn alternatives, right? Not everybody wants a nice, plush, beautiful zoysia or Bermuda lawn, right? No, no. Mm -hmm. And we, first, we got to find out what. What do you want to do with your yard? Right. I mean, you've got all this space around your house. Mm -hmm. What is it? How do you use it? What is it used for? Okay. And maybe you can do something different with it. Um, also, do you have kids? Do they need to run around on something right. large mm -hmm. and flat? Um, how about pets? Mm -hmm. Now, it's, uh, dogs don't necessarily need grass all the time. So okay. th any surface, they'll run on. <laughs> they'll have fun, you know. So, so pets, you don't have to have a lawn just for, you say, oh, well, I can't get rid of my lawn because I have a dog. No, they, they don't care. Right. They don't care. They really don't care. <laughs> um, also, you might have a steep slope mm -hmm. that you don't want to mow anymore, and that would you yeah, know, it would be nice to have something different on it. Sure. Um, also, you might have a shady area under a tree, mm -hmm. can't mm -hmm. get grass to grow. Mm -hmm. Or there might be small spaces on maybe the north side or an, a niche somewhere around your house that doesn't get a lot of sunlight and grass doesn't grow. Um, all these zero lot lines now, you know, there's very small space and on the north side sometimes grass doesn't, there's yeah, not enough light exactly right. to grow because mm -hmm. the building is there. Mm -hmm. um, so we just got to, to uh, think about how you're going to use the space first or okay. what the problem is that you're trying to solve. Okay. Now, one thing you do need to remember, I know you, know you don't have to do something every week with an alternative, but you still have to maintain it at some ah, point. So it still has to be maintained. Yeah, there is, there right. is no That's such thing as thing. a no maintenance right. lawn right. uh, landscape. I was There's waiting no, for you to say that. There is no sense of, right. uh, you know, you might save your time every week, but uh -huh. it, you're going to have to work out there at some point. Good, good point. So good let's point. go over the expensive things you All can right. do. <laughs> Look at Mr. D. He like <laughs> Put in a pool. He knows. You know, it's Put hot in outside. Pool. Put in a pool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a, that's <laughs> an expensive one. How about a basketball court or a uh -huh. volleyball court? Uh -huh. There's a lot of people that, you know, build up sand and make a, their own permanent uh -huh. volleyball courts out there. Um, a uh, putting green, putting green, but made of artificial turf. Artificial there turf, right, right. Yeah. Now, <laughs> now, but, and then, right. then let's talk about artificial turf. Because, okay. you know, that's used a lot in the southwest and in the xeroscaping. Uh -huh. Because they want the green look, right. but they don't want they can't grow grass, so they don't want to use the water for grass. It takes a lot less water. A okay. lot less <laughs> water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mowing, but right. it still has to be maintained. Okay. And wear it out. Yeah, mm. you still it still has to be maintained. Okay. Um, how about ponds to put uh -huh. fish in? Mm -hmm. In fact, I remember seeing a whole backyard that was a series of ponds that were all connected. They had a lot of koi fish in them mm. and then they have paths over them with patio areas here and there and landscaping and it was really nice yeah. but that's kind of expensive to right. do. Right, you got to maintain, maintain those too. Yeah. Mm. And you have to maintain that, mm -hmm. yes. Mm. All right, well, so those are the expensive things. Yeah, now, like some other, some yeah. of the, some of these other things are, can be expensive but they're not as expensive. And like gravel. Like gravel, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're we're going to talk about hardscapes. All right. You okay. know, flagstones, all different kinds of, okay. you know, Arkansas oh, yeah. flagstone. There's blue flagstone. There's all kinds of okay. stone out there that you can make paths with. Okay. And you can either cement them together and make it nice and flat, or you can just set them on the ground and then plant little dwarf plants around them uh, so it's not solid I like that. landscaping. Mm -hmm. Then there is bricks and brick pavers concrete pavers that you know look like bricks that you put together mm -hmm. there are rocks rocks there's mulch yeah. there are yeah. seashells seashells but you know what oh. you i would highly recommend in most places that that have rock, especially rocks as part of the landscaping 
they will put landscape fabric down first. Uh -huh. So, because our soil around here, if we, you step on those rocks, you're going to end. There's going to end up into oh, the soil, then, and you're, okay. then it's defeating the purpose. Right. Yeah. Uh, but in the same token, you you can do a lot of interesting things with different rocks, and I have seen that. Oh, but okay. if you let the leaves and debris fall on that and don't pick it up, it's going to just decompose, and then you're going to have the same problem on with okay. your rocks where, where there's going to be organic matter for weeds to grow. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you you've weeds got, got to make there's maintenance to all of these mm -hmm. different things. Uh, oh, there is something called a porous concrete. There's they're doing this a lot. You can you pour water over the concrete and just goes right straight through it. Yeah, I've seen them. And so it really really nice and it, it, kind of expensive. Uh, I've seen people put that on their driveway in strips. You know, just where the tires go, and then they'll plant gr low ground cover in between. Yeah, the old Hollywood drives, what mm -hmm. they call that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and so, but that's that's one way to use that. And then, of course, there's also uh, polymers. They'll put aggregate and polymers, and it's, it's supposed to look like concrete. So there's and they make stepping stones out of there. There's 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 many more things out there that you can use, but hardscapes, okay. not a plant. Hardscape. Then we got to talk about plants. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you right. said, well, I don't want to do any of those things, or I don't have enough area that I want to do. I want to do something else. Okay, there are people that use meadows as mm -hmm. their yard. Now, a lot of people have long amounts of, of uh, turf to use with this, large properties. Right. You know, they will get meadow mixes from different parts of the country. There's, they're formulated for different parts okay. of the country. So you can get a meadow mix and you can find ornamental grasses and plants that are native to mm -hmm. your area. And then you plant those okay. instead of grass. See that, okay. All right, so that's one thing you can do. And that's kind of, you know, popular. And I had a, a ornithologist friend of mine who said he, he was going to do that with his yard because oh, the meadow the meadow because he, he thought it would attract more birds. So you don't mow uh, it, you just kind of let it grow up. Yeah, it's because it's it's all native and it doesn't get you know real high or tall. So okay, I got some native stuff at my place that gets <laughs> real tall. It's real tall. Some of the native stuff is mare's tail. Yeah, and, you know, it'll get twelve feet tall. Well, <laughs> see, and that's one of the problems that we are going to have in this area yeah. with changing anything other than grass, yeah. even though we have the same problem with grass, is we have a lot of weed pressure here. Yes, we do. Yeah. We are in a transition zone, so we get northern weeds and southern weeds mm -hmm. and everything in between. Eastern and in weeds the, and western weeds. We have perennial <laughs> we weeds covered. and annual weeds. Yeah, we we have uh, winter weeds and summer weeds. So that is going to be the major problem in the Mid-South here with us trying to keep something else other than lawns. Because the weeds, are, a lot. Of, if my lawn is mostly crabgrass anyway, oh, so yeah. you so know, is, so um, is mine. and not bad. grass, it wouldn't be green if it weren't right, for those that's two. Right. <laughs> that's right. So uh, you know, it's, there's weeds everywhere. But another thing you might try is mass planting. So there's you know just a series of beds with your flagstone in between, and just have just trees, shrubs, plants, you know, perennials, annuals. Just mix it all up. You just have different areas and just mass that kind of planting. Which would help cut down maybe on some of your weed pressure. It you would. Know, now, if you've got shady area, right. moss. Moss. Moss I've is really popular. Of, yeah, I've mm -hmm. seen a lot of And moss, moss looks moss. really, really good it in the does. shade. Yeah. And I don't, you know, it really does more mimic lawn mm -hmm. than anything That's else legit. that I can think of. And it's very easy to maintain. So, I mean, moss is a great alternative mm. for, a, for a shady area. Okay. Another thing that seems to be popular is clover, both Dutch yeah. clover and red clover. Right. But I was thinking about that, and you know that can be a foot tall or so, or you know get up that way. And if you have animals and kids that are running around, that might be a little prohibitive for them to run around on. Right. But yeah. if you don't, that would be a great alternative. And you might. If you're running around barefooted, you might get stung by a honeybee. Yeah, you might, you <laughs> might. I'm speaking from experience. I'm oh, so you know that. Yeah. Right. You might get stung by a bee. You never know. Um, and of course, there's all kinds of plants that are used as ground covers. We've got mondo grasses. We've got um, vinca major and vinca yeah. minor. We've got uh, shrubs that are small, mm -hmm. like uh, junipers. junipers. There's a lot of yeah. ground hugging mm -hmm. junipers that will do great in a sunny or on a slope area. Mm -hmm. um, we've got 
oh, good grief, um, Nandinas that are dwarf, uh, monkey grasses, creeping yeah. Jenny, ajuga. I mean, you, the list That's goes on okay. and on, and it can. And we're talking hostas, daylilies, shade. We've got stuff for shade. They've got stuff for partly shade. We've got stuff for sunny. So anything will work. You can plant something anywhere. Just remember, there is going to be some maintenance with it. It's going to be some maintenance. Yep. University. I hear that. <laughs> some more than others. Some yes. more than others. Joel, that was good stuff. Thank you much. Thank you much. Let's talk a little bit about Kalinga. There's a lot of Kalinga in this lawn here. There's a little patch right here. There's some patches here. Little bitty patches coming up here. And this is what it looks like when it's full grown. Kalinga is considered to be a sedge. A distinct characteristic of Kalinga is this. You have the little seed head, okay, a little seed ball here. And then right underneath that seed head would be three leaves, okay? So again, seed head, three leaves. That's a distinct characteristic of Kalinga. In a lawn situation, you could use image to control Kalinga. Read and follow the label. But in a situation like this, where it's growing around some of your desirable plants, the best thing would probably be to pull it out, right? Because you definitely don't want to use a chemical here because you might get it on your desirable plant. Here's a blueberry. So again, I would just pull as much of this Kalinga out as possible. All right, Mr. D, let's talk a little bit about insecticides. Let's right? do. Let's and, do. and let's start by talking about carbaryl. Carbaryl. It's a carbamate, uh, one naphtha methyl carbamate is what carbaryl <laughs> is, been around for a long time, uh, developed by I think Union Carbide in 1958. Wow, I, was, I was three years old. Oh, how about that? I was three years old. <laughs> I still remember. You still remember? Yeah. Uh, how about that? It is the third most used insecticide in the United States. The, wow. The third. trade name was Seven. Seven. For years yeah. and years it was Seven and Seven. And I saw, I found some Seven somewhere a few years ago that wasn't carbaryl and I really? the nerve of them to do that. <laughs> the and, nerve of them. But anyway, it is a, <laughs> most of the insecticides uh. that I looked at were acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, which is a, acetylcholinesterase is a, it has something to do with a, the synapse nerve ending, mm -hmm. allowing Im nerve impulses to, to, to work and it inhibits that. So it basically, it, it, it inhibits the nervous system right. of these critters. And um, these things were derived from nerve gases oh boy. developed by the military oh organizations. Wow. And, but they're not the same thing, sure. but it has the same mode of action, acetylcholinase wow. inhibitors. But uh, it is, uh, it, it, it can be absorbed, you know, or they, you can ingest it. And so chewing insects, I, or this is usually a pretty good product mm. for chewing insects because they ingest it and, and then it does, does its thing. But uh, uh, very, very widely used yeah. uh, insecticide. Insecticides are not immune to resistance. And I can remember back in my years as an extension agent, at one time, this was the most widely recommended uh, product to use for flea control. Mm. And it got to the point where it took like 10 times more carbaryl to kill a flea than wow. it did than when they originally started using it. Right. And so I don't even think you see this recommended for flea control anymore because I think fleas are pretty much resistant to it. Mm. Uh, but um, for, it's, it's, it's not a restricted use pesticide. You know, you follow the label, follow the label. And, yes. and it will take care of, a, a still still commonly recommended for a lot of the chewing insects. I think squash bugs and, mm -hmm. and, squash and, bugs. and, and uh, squash a lot of caterpillars yeah. that, that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that it'll, it'll work. It also, it works on a lot of, uh, well, it works on the caterpillars that BT takes care of too. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's important to identify the insects because you would much rather use Bacillus thuringiensis on a sure. caterpillar that it's effective on than and to use seven because it is a non-selective. It will kill, you know, just most insects that it, including beneficial. Right, so the bees be or something, yeah, yeah, that be comes to mind. Right, right. So be, be careful when you use yeah. Follow the label and uh, target, you know, the pest that you want to kill. 
Yeah, but a lot of folks use that. Mm -hmm. It's highly recommended, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. So the next insecticide, let's talk about permethrin. Permethrin, mm -hmm. uh, it's a synthetic pyrethroid, been around since 1973. Uh -huh. And uh, it, is, uh, it mimics uh, the chemicals that, the naturally occurring chemicals that derive from chrysanthemums, mm -hmm. uh, pyrethrin, mm -hmm. which is a very toxic insecticide that's developed from, from mums. Um, but uh, there are a lot of uh, synthetic pyrethroids out there. Permethrin is the one that I'm mentioning here, but there's also cypermethrin. Yeah. There's alpha cypermethrin. <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot of synthetic pyrethroids out there. They are also non selective. Uh, they will kill about anything you mm. put on them. And so it's very important that you uh, kind of know what your beneficials are and try to avoid using Good them point. to avoid taking out your beneficial right. insects. Good point. But, uh, uh, very, very widely used pesticide. And I'm sure it attacks the nervous system like the rest of your insects. Right, it, it is part. also a, a, a acetylcholase inhibitor. It was, when they first used it, when permethrin was first developed, it was primarily used for, for humans to control scabies uh. and lice. Nicks, uh. the, uh, the, uh, uh, it's a product that would have head lice, you know, uh. that you, NIX, that you use to take uh, is, is commonly recommended. Uh, hunters use permethrin to to, uh, to spray on their clothes and boots oh. and things like that to kill ticks. Okay. And uh, chiggers, chiggers also okay. keep chiggers yeah, yeah. from attacking them. Yeah. But in 1973, it's okay. I said it's been around since 1973. But permethrin made the list of the World Health Organization's. It's considered a list of essential medicines. Wow. An insecticide that uh, the essential, World Health right. Organization considers an essential medicine wow. because of all the insect pests that you know carry you know life-threatening diseases uh, all over the world. Insects will develop resistance to to permethrin also. It's it's a product. My first uh, 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 contact with permethrin was in insecticidal ear tags. Flea collars. Oh, okay. And uh, I used to, I did some work in the beef industry with insecticidal ear tags. I'd ride around and use binoculars to count uh, flies on cows, and okay. and uh, uh, it was really good for a while. But after a few years, the, the the flies developed a resistance to it, and so they start using different products and mix it up a little bit. And that's it's important to do that. Uh, if you go to the Red Book. Mm -hmm. And uh, UT's Red Book, and look at the ins different insecticides that are, are listed. Many times you'll see a carbamate, and yeah. then a, and then a, a pyrethroid, and sometimes an organophosphate mm -hmm. for the same insect. Mix them up. Mix you, them know. up. you know, it means you got to have three products on the shelf, but mix them up a little bit, and and that will help you not run into a, an insect resistance problem. Okay. So the next insecticide let's talk about is imidacloprid, which is one that we're hearing a lot about and which actually causes a little controversy. It does, it does. It's a, it's a neonicotinoid. Mm -hmm. It's one of the neonicotinoids and it uh, you know, resembles nicotine. Uh, fipronil is a trade name, transform yeah. is another trade name. It is a systemic insecticide. It acts as an insect neurotoxin which also prevents the acetylcholine from transmitting impulses between the nerve synapses, and uh, so it interferes with the nervous system, system like some yeah. of the other products that we talked about. It is a contact insecticide mm -hmm. and ingestion insecticide. So, you know, they eat what you spray it on. Mm -hmm. I know it's probably one of the, the uh, few products that takes care of uh, aphids and grain sorghum. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a very, it, it's, there's some emergency use uh, you know, permits out there because of uh, the, uh, the, it is the only product that will work on some insects out there. Now, uh, there are some, some controversy out there that's mm -hmm. been accused of uh, being uh, a part of the decline in naturally occurring, you know, native honeybees. Yeah. But, uh, you know, there are no colony, native. Colony, yeah, collapse disorder. Yeah, colony yeah. collapse disorder mm -hmm. and all that from, from even the, the uh, the bee producers, mm -hmm. but you know there are no native honeybees right. in this country. Uh, the the yeah, honeybee right. we have is Apis mellifera. It's a European honeybee, mm -hmm. and we brought it to this country. Right. Um, and there's been some research. There's been quite a lot of research done, and and some of the research I've seen is it's more of a they, they the research I've seen has not traced it directly to neo uh, neonicotinoids. It's the, uh, been several things. It's been a, a, yeah, a diet. Been, it's you know, been, yeah, it's been uh, 
high around. beetles, a combination, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and mites and, right. and, and, and things like that that have, that have been part of the problem. Yeah, and we actually but, had uh, the Bartlett Bee Whisperer, David Glover, was on here telling us that. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think some of the negative press that's gotten is, 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 is not deserved. Uh, follow the label, and I, it's a very, very widely used, uh, I mean, it's used, uses, uh, used for termite control in, in homes and, and flea control, and, and, and it's just a, a very non-toxic to, to mammals, so it's a safe as far as people are concerned. And, uh, Read the label. Read the label. Follow the label. Read the label. All of these. That's right. All right. So thanks, Mr. Dean. It's good stuff. Okay. Good stuff. Our blueberries have done really well this year. As a matter of fact, we've already begun harvesting them. Uh, the Bermuda grass around the blueberries have done well also, and that's not good. Uh, we don't like our blueberries to have to compete with Bermuda grass for water and nutrients. So I have in my spray mixture uh, a product that uh, will kill Bermuda grass. It may take more than one application, but I'm going to treat it now and maybe come back a little bit later if the Bermuda grass is not gone and take it out as Cethoxidem is the active ingredient. I've also included a, a crop oil concentrate, a methylated seed oil as a surfactant, which is very important. Uh, if you don't include that, the herbicide won't work. So I'm just going to try to do as good a job as I can and I'm going to kill a pretty wide swath here because I don't want this Bermuda grass to mess with my blueberries. That ought to do the trick. So the Q&A segment, y'all ready for these? These are good questions. These are really good questions. All right, so here's our first viewer email. Do you know what this is? I think I grew it from C, but the writing washed off. Could it be Angel Trumpet? And this is from Miss Kathleen right here in Memphis. Angel Trumpet, if you look at the leaves, right? You look they're, at the little, they're, they're kind of fuzzy looking. Yeah, fuzzy, little purplish stems. Yeah, and it got a uh, kind of thick, uh, thick texture to them. Little, mm. little fuzzy on the leaves. Makes me nice. think. <laughs> yeah, I would think she's probably right. Yeah, yeah I think that, I think that's what it is. So if you look at the leaves, it does yeah. look fuzzy. It has the purple stems. I, I think that's what that is, Miss Kathleen. So that will be your angel trumpet. Thanks for the question. Here's our next for email. Can you tell me <laughs> if this is a fern? Are a pretty weed. I found it growing in a fence row on my property, and this is from a Sharon. So, fern or pretty weed? <laughs> it's a pretty fern. It's a pretty fern, right? Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Yes. Lucky. She's lucky. I mean, there are native ferns around. So what are they call them bracken ferns, or uh, uh, there's so many, there's there so are many several yes. different ones. But yep. it's obviously growing there and it's doing well. Looks and it's a lot of it. And I think she's very fortunate. That yep. it's there. I wouldn't. I, that's a very nice fern. Yep. Um, I like that. Yeah, so it's not bad. So it is a fern. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, of course, now her, you know, a weed. Yeah. What yeah. is. A weed is a plant growing out of place. Yeah. If, if it's so just, if it's not where you want it, then it's considered a weed. But I would, like you, I would want it. I would I want, want that want fern want the there. Fern. It's yeah. pretty. It seems like it was a lot of it and it was looked yeah. healthy. It looked to very me. healthy. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, I would so obviously it. it likes the conditions that it's in. Mm -hmm. Might get, hand pull some of the others away and give it more room so it can spread. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's good. All right, so there you have it, Miss Sharon. Pretty fern. How about that? Okay. All right, here's our next viewer email. Can you deadhead a knockout rose by cutting off a whole branchlet if every bloom on it is spent? And this is from Miss Kathleen right here in Memphis. So the old knockout rose. rose. Oh right? wow! I have one at home. So what do you think about that? Do you think it's necessary to prune off? No, or cut you don't off have to cut the whole because you're nah. and all roses. You're supposed to cut back the uh, branch after the spent bloom is is gone mm -hmm. to the like the fifth or seventh Seven. leaf mm -hmm. one, and then you want to cut to an outward uh, a leaf that is facing right. outward right. because you want to get the plant to to spread out for air circulation because of all the disease problems with roses, you give as much air circulation as possible. Mm -hmm. So no, she doesn't have to do that. But um, I'm kind of curious uh -oh. as to why there's a whole bunch of them on that particular stem. Okay. Because that reminds me of a problem that we have now called rose rosette. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if that's the case, I mean, not, not with the picture, we don't know. Right, we don't know. But if it does have rose rosette, you might as well just take out the whole plant. 
because it's never going to go away. Right. And it, and right. it's a mite that vectors that, so it, it'll spread it around. Yeah, it's an aerophile mite. Yeah. So I don't, you know, <laughs> if you like roses and this one particular one has it, Better you might want to get rid of get it out. faster so it doesn't affect the other roses you have if you have more roses. Right. And another thing too about knockout roses, and of course, uh, again, I have one at home, they're pretty much self-cleaning. Yeah. yeah, that's why I'm, I'm curious as to why, I mean, does, why does it look so bad that she wants to cut it off? And that's what made me think of Rose Rosette. So there you have it, Miss Kathleen. A picture would help us out. Yeah. But yeah, we're, uh, we're thinking maybe Rose Rosette or something else. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But if it's Rose Rosette, it has to come out. All right. So Mr. D, Ms. Joella, it's been fun. Yes, it has. All right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching us. It's the half hour show too short. Every week we have extra videos we post online at familyplotgarden.com. Go watch them. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plots, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.